I need you all to do me a favor. <coughs> Indulge me, okay? Join with me. Jesus said he stretched out his hands to the disciples. I, I want you to look to your left or to your right or to your back or to your front, and I just want you all to stretch out your hands to each one of them and just say, these, these. are my family. Well, this is my family. And these, and these are my friends. Are my friends. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I love the way Jesus has a way of teaching. He takes an opportunity. Whether he's healing somebody, delivering somebody, whether the disciples have a question and they're a little confused or lack of understanding, he makes the most of an opportunity by showing truth in a situation. And so today, he sat there, and he looked at the opportunity because you know Jesus loves his mother, his earthly mother. Yeah. But let me share something with you. He never called her mom. Right. If you look at when he was in the temple at 12 years old, mm -hmm. listening and asking questions when Joseph and Mar Mary had left, Three days journey and realized Jesus wasn't with him. Something's wrong with that picture right there. You left your child and don't know that you left your child? And you'd have gone three days. Anyway, he comes back. He finds him in the temple. And he says, Jesus, don't you care that your father and I have, have been anxiously looking for you? He says, woman, don't you know did I care about my father's business? Yeah. He said, woman. He didn't say, mom. He said, woman. Remember when he turned the water into wine? The first miracle in Cana of Galilee. The Bible says his mother. See, he can talk when he says about his mother. He'll use the words mother, his mother. But when he talks to his mother, she said, Jesus, they run out of wine. He says, woman. My hour has not yet come. He didn't say mom. He says woman. When he was on the cross. And he was about to die and give up his last breath. He looks down and he sees John, the disciple whom he loved. And he saw his mother. And he says, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. Not one time have I seen in the scriptures Jesus said, Mom or Mother. So what is it, and why was it that he looked at her differently in that sense as opposed to the deeper and the bigger sense that he's trying to explain to us here today? Look, he says here, verse 47, then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he's answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? He says, and he stretched out his hands, and he says, all of these. He included more than one person to be his mother. More than one person to be his brother or sisters. You notice he didn't say father, though. There's but one father. But he stretched out his hands and he says, anyone who does the will of my father, these are my brothers and my mother and my sisters. He was trying to make a point that there's a difference between an earthly family and a kingdom family. Now, I've got to share this story with you because of what happened as I was preparing this message. Years ago, 2000, I believe it was four, I was ordained pastor elder under the Pentecostal umbrella. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm not Baptist. I'm not Methodist. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Episcopal. I, I'm, I'm a child of God. Amen. I am a follower of Christ. Yes. I'm a believer in Jesus. If you want to know who I am, I came into the family, into the family, the spiritual family of Christ. 
They said, well, okay, I hear you, but why is that important today? Because of what I want to share with you. My ordination was different than I think a lot of people's. Because the bishop who ordained me didn't know me. You say, well, how could that be? Because the pastor who called the bishop to request for my ordination asked me to come and meet the bishop at a service that we were honoring him. Well, they were honoring him. I didn't know him. So I go to this church, and we're honoring him, and I'm asked to be one of the speakers. Don't know the bishop, but I'm asked to be one of the speakers. So I go there, and there's like four of us that are on the program. The bishop meets me one time. You hear me? Yes, somebody hear me? He meets me one time. And he says to me, after understanding that he's going to ordain me, he says, I don't know you, but there's something about you. Now, the reason I bring that up, I talked to Pastor Charles the other day for the first time. Never met him before. But one time on the phone, before we got off the phone, we both said the same thing. I feel a connection to you, my brother. A kindred spirit. And what I'm trying to tell you, that happens when you come into the kingdom. See, the bishop doesn't have to know me. He has to know God. The bishop doesn't have to know me. He has to know the God in me. See, the bishop, only thing he did was following the obedience of the Christ that is the Messiah, the anointed one, that said, yes, this is one that I've chosen, and I want you, bishop, because I called you to lay hands on him, to ordain him. Do you know, Yvonne can testify to this, that bishop and I stayed connected the rest of his life. He passed on. But I want you to know something. Yvonne can testify to this. His last sermon was at our church. He almost crawled in there. He was that done. His wife didn't want him to come and preach because he had lost the weight. He was frail. He had to use a cane. When he preached, he had to use a, a, a chair. But what he did was witness to everybody else in there, mm -hmm. I'm called to do this. Yeah. And if I got to crawl in there, yeah. I'm going to crawl in there. And it blessed me because it showed me the conviction mm -hmm. and the dedication of one chosen to preach the gospel and not allow anything to stop him from doing it. Yeah. And through those years, all those years, we not only became friends, we became brothers and family and friends in Christ. Yeah. So what am I saying? When I was looking at this message, Lord, where do you want me to go? I got off the phone with Pastor Charles. And the Lord says, you know, this is Family and Friends Day. And he reminded me of that bishop's uh, uh, meeting that we had, an ordination that we had. He not only laid hands on my head, he laid hands on my, he anointed my hands. He got down on his knees, anointed my feet, and charged me and discharged me to go forth and preach the gospel. And Pastor Charles and I got to talking and shouting, and I told him, I said, you're going to make me start to have a hallelujah moment, moment up in here. I'm about to shout up in here because of the kindred spirit. We are brothers. I didn't know him. They hadn't even met him personally or physically until today. Yeah. But on that phone, the spirit in me recognized the spirit in him. Right. And we became brothers. This is what family and friends is all about. Jesus is saying, look, who is my brother and who are my, I mean, who is my mother and who are my brothers? All of you that are born again, this is my family now. See, a spiritual family you can't get rid of. Right. <laughs> I just want y'all to know, y'all stuck with me, all right? Yeah. An earthly family, you might have some different disagreements, heartaches, you might go your separate ways. But in God's family, that ain't happening. Right. Not if you're in God, look, let me say that again. In God's family, 
Because if you're in God's family, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't treat your brother or your sister any old kind of way and think God is not going to say something, convict you to go get it right with your brother. Do you know what the Bible tells us? Don't even offer up your praise. Don't even offer up your giving of your offerings, of your tithes and offerings. He says, go, leave your offerings at the altar. Go get it right with your brother. Yes. Then come back and I'll receive you. Yes, because if you treat your brother like that, who you can see, mm -hmm. how are you going to treat God who you can't? Right. Turn with me to 1 Peter. Chapter 2. See, we need to understand where we were and where we are. Chapter 2, 1 Peter, and verse 9 and 10 says this. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. God took each one of us from the muck and the miry and the dirt and the filth and all the unrighteousness that we were before we were washed. There's not one righteous, no, not one. God says, before you're born again, this is where you were. He says, but my everlasting and my love and my grace and, and my mercy, I reached down and grabbed you when you needed me the most and put me, pulled me out of that place and set me in a broad place and brought me out of darkness. Now I can see clearly now in a marvelous light. Amen. Now I can reflect the image of God by nature. By being born again. He says, who once were not a people, verse 10, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God says, you weren't my people at one point. I like, I like to say it like this. You know, we were God's creation. We were brought forth in this world to procreate. Thank goodness, Pastor Charles. Pastor Teresa, these are uh, 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 my father back there, amen. Another parent and grandparents, amen, because it's through the family, earthly family, that you have to start pouring into your children and your children's children so that you train them up, as we shared earlier, putting them in, them, putting them in the right environment, away from all the crazy stuff of this world. You know, you can't take them out of the world. They're going to have to deal with the world. But you got to give them some ammunition. You got to give them something, some, something that's going to cause them to be able to stand in the face of the adversary and say, this is the day the Lord has made. We will be victorious over anything that the world or the devil brings our way. That's when you can say that. The Bible says, submit unto God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. But you got to submit. You got to have God as your back. If God be for you, who can be against you? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I got God in me. I'm talking about the fullness of God. I ain't talking about just the Holy Spirit, which is enough because the Holy Spirit is God. But I'm talking about the fullness, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That means I have the will of God in me because that's the Father's will. I have the word of God because Jesus is the word. Yes. And I have the power of God or the work. I, I, I like to use three W's. The will, the work, and the word. Yes. And I have the work of the Holy Spirit in me. The power that gives me what I need in order to be victorious. Y'all with me? Yes. So we became a people of God. How did that happen? The most familiar scripture probably in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Yes. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But here's what I want you to see in John. I want you to look at this as we pick up in verse uh, chapter 3. 
And as we pick up and um, almost there. Amen. In verse um, 5, actually verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one, one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of, of, of heaven or kingdom of God. But go back to verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. One time he says you can't see it, which means you can't understand. Right. You can't understand anything I'm saying, Nicodemus, mm -hmm. because you have to be born again. Right. You have to have the spirit of God in you to bring you into the family of God. Right. Then we can make all things clear. But then he goes on in verse 6, he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That's your, your earthly family. God blessed us to have parents. And remember, those parents have a responsibility to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? That's what he said in Genesis, wasn't it? Yeah. He said it again in chapter 8 of Noah. I mean, uh, Genesis when Noah came in. And Noah, he, he sent forth, he didn't say you can have dominion, Noah, but he did say be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He stopped there. The point is, he wants us to procreate the word of God in our children. He wants them to be, to multiply this earth with godliness. Right. Multiply this earth with people that look like me, Jesus, God says. Amen? Amen. And that's our responsibility. Right. We were talking earlier and I, I shared with him, just like him, I mean, just like uh, Pastor Charles and I, I have a grandson, and the same thing. It's like I, I'm, I'm trying to pour into him because I see something about this young man that God is calling him. And our job as parents and grandparents, and if God willing, you have a great grandparent, is to make sure that our children understand, one, salvation. Yes. That's the most important thing. Amen. Do you understand why you're saved or how you got saved? Do you understand what it means? Do you understand that? And you explain that to your children. So that when they're ready, at some point, God will draw them. He said, because no one can come to me unless I draw them by my spirit. Look at what it says here. That which is born of flesh is flesh, verse 6. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But look, verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, Nicodemus. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes, where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. We cannot look at somebody and say, you're saved, or you're not saved, or you will get saved. I, I know you're going to get saved. No, God knows who's going to get saved. Our job is to make sure that they're ready. Mm -hmm. That when God calls them by name, they hear and they respond. I believe a lot of time in our generation where we are now, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. So now that children grow up and don't know the significance of your salvation mm -hmm. or the, the price that it costs Jesus on the cross. We did Good Friday a couple weeks ago and I'm going to move on. And one of the things I said was, why do we call it Good Friday? Was it good for Jesus? Or was it good for us? It was definitely good for us. Yeah. But I don't think Jesus hanging on the cross being pierced with nails in his hands and feet is saying, oh, this is a good thing today. This is a good day. I don't think when that crown of thorns was pressing upon his skull, blood streaming down, and the sword about to be pierced, and they mocking him as he carrying the cross, knowing that the cross signifies condemnation, and he's a sinless, spotless, Lamb of God. But we celebrate Good Friday. Well, we shouldn't celebrate. We should recognize. We should acknowledge. We should mourn the fact that he did that so that on Sunday morning, when we're ready to shout, because our hearts 
And I said this one service too. I wonder if God, well, I know he does, but I wish I could feel what he feels. See, he can feel what I feel because he's God. But I can't feel unless he reveals it, unless he manifests this feeling that he has right now. Because when I feel sorry, and when I feel, Lord, forgive me, because you paid the price for me, and you had to suffer. When I start to think about that, and I feel that, I know he feels it. But then how does he feel? I want to feel him acknowledging, I feel what you're feeling. Here's a little of what I feel to bless you back. Okay, I'm almost done. There's three things I want to share with you. I call it three major blessings from God that occurred when we got born again. Amen? And each one of them begins with the first three words, through the Spirit. Number one, through the Spirit, we're joined to a huge family, an everlasting family, a family that will not turn their back on you. Do you know that right now, when we, and not just me, but when we pray, and I think we should sometimes, if not a lot of times, but all the time, when we pray for the body of Christ, it's not just us here. When we fall on our knees and Father, we pray that the body will become more unified. We pray, Lord God, that the body of Christ will become more built up. We pray, when we start to pray that, do you know your brothers over in Russia will, will then receive the blessing of your prayer and never met? Why? Kindred spirit. The same spirit. There's but one God. There's but one body. Many members. That's why I said, you know, when we look at how big this family is, there's a multitude you can't count. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 6. I marvel, listen to this, only one gospel. This, well, that's my, that's my subtitle. It says one gospel. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Be careful, church. You hear what I'm saying? We're born into this family. And Paul is saying that sometimes, depending on your focus, you can easily be swayed away. And forget your brother or your sisters. And start to hang out back in the world the way we used to do. There's nothing wrong with, you can't, you can't change folks, okay? You can witness to folks. How can you witness? You got to be around them. But they got to see something different. They got to see that, you know, you have changed. You have transformed. Amen? You did get up from that wheelchair. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. People didn't marvel and wonder how did that happen. Amen. People see the signs and wonders of God only by the hand of God in you or upon you. And so we have to be careful when we look back at that. And now turn with me to John, back, back to John 3.16. Well, we never read that, but we're going to go there. John 3, 16. We're going to read verses uh, 16 through 18. Verse 16 says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his world or send into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. We get saved only because, again, our faith in his grace. Yeah. Combination. Faith without works is dead. Yeah. But you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven without the grace of God. Grace, the grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Yeah. And now, Pastor, i got to share this. The Lord gave me an extra meaning to this. Grace is... Anything 
that we need. God's unlimited power. It doesn't make a difference what you need. God's got enough grace to supply all your need. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Whatever it is you need, whatever you're going through, I don't know if I'm going to make it through today. Yes, you will. Mm -hmm. By God's grace, you will. Yeah. And when you get on the other side and you start to look back, you can say, it is only by God's grace yeah. that I laid it through this. Yeah. Because it's God's grace that we rely on. But turn with me one more place, and then we're going to be on our second point. First John. Talking about brothers. And we're going to look at um, actually the same thing, chapter, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3. Are you there? Amen. Verse 16 through 18. Look at this. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Talking about Jesus. And we also ought to lay down our lives for who? The brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Mm -hmm. See, this family that we're in is about looking out for one another. Yes, we get phone calls, pastors, don't we? Pray for me. And we do. But praying is, is good, but what about when they say, I need? Will you be willing to sacrifice yeah. something that you had that maybe you held dear? Mm -hmm. That this brother or sister might need. Yeah. And God says, give it away. Because they need it more than you do. Yeah. And remember, I'm the supplier of your need. Yeah. If you give, it shall be given back to you. Amen. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You can't be God-given. One of the things that I hope and pray that we all understand is that whatever we have, if God says give, let it go. Give it away. Look out for your brother. Restore one who has fallen. When you see your brother in sin, don't just talk about him. Say, oh, man, he backslid. No, she done backslid. No, why don't you go and reach down and get down there with them yeah. and say, my brother, I, I, I see what you're going through. I, I don't understand everything, mm -hmm. but I'm here for you. Yeah. What can I do? Yeah. Let's pray. Do you know prayer moves God yeah. into that situation? Mm -hmm. By faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Through the same spirit, number two, God will connect you with people of a kindred spirit. Let me just come over here. Do one of these high fives, amen? Right. You, you, know, you ain't going nowhere, my brother, amen? Praise the Lord. But turn with me, if you would, to that, for, to uh, Romans. I mean, uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel. Y'all know the story of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Y'all yeah. know of the three Hebrew boys that stood their ground yeah. when it got a little hot, <laughs> amen? And they try to turn up the heat, what is it, seven times or ten times hotter? Yeah. Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. <clears throat> and it says here, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods? Or worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, uh, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image, thou shalt have no other images before me, worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall not, or you shall be cast immediately into the fiery furnace. And who, I like this, I love this part, because he's asking, he says, and who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? Well, let's see, I'm in the family now. I got God as my father. He's my father and he's my God. Oh, oh and just so you don't understand, I have a host of angels. Some are archangels, like Michael, who's the fighter. Uh, and just 
though you might not understand, I got some brothers, some prayer warriors and sisters who will go to prayer on their knees to protect me from you. Yes. Who is the God that is able to deliver you? He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 16, answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no, no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Now, I like this, because he says, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we, serve, will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Shadrach had Abednego with him. Abednego had who? Meshach. There were three brothers that stood side by side and said, Oh, king, we have no need to even answer you. But if we must answer, let me tell you about my God. He is able to deliver us. And by the way, he will deliver us from your hand. Now, let me stop right there. Because what he's saying is, whether in this lifetime or the next lifetime, I'm going to be delivered. Yeah. But then he says, but if not, now he's talking about if you throw us in there and we die. Mm -hmm. Oh well, let it be known yeah. that we will not bow down. Yeah. We will not serve an image. That's right. Amen? Mm -hmm. What am I saying? I'm saying to you that today, you need to find or not find, let the Lord lead you. <laughs> I don't know how many times I'm going to do this. <laughs> to a kindred spirit. Yes, yes, say that. God will bring people in your life that your spirits will connect. Yes. yes. And when they connect, yes. that's your brother from another mother. Yes. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Lastly, through the same spirit, this is what we receive when we're born again. The creator of every living thing becomes our Father. Romans chapter 8. We're going to close right here. Romans chapter 8. We're going to read verses 14 through 17. This is, the subtitle is Sonship through the Spirit. Now you see where I say, by the Spirit, through the Spirit. Here's why. Verse 12 of chapter 8 of Romans says this. Therefore, brethren, brother, family, Amen. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the, the, the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led, that's the key. As many as are led by the spirit. And if you notice, it should be a capital S. The other S was a small S. The capital S is the Holy Spirit. If you are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You, my brothers and sisters, have been adopted and brought into the family of God. And now we're called children and sons. Son, sons is a general term for women and men. Amen? But look at what it says. Verse 15, for you did not receive the little as spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, translated, is a more intimate than just saying Father. Yes. Abba, translated, is when you say Daddy. Yes. When you, y'all you, you, know what I'm talking about. Yes. When you say Daddy, I mean... I mean, some people probably say father to their real father. But I think it's more personable, personable to say daddy. And that's what God is saying. Now that you're born into the family, I'm your daddy. And he says here, verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's when you're talking about kindred spirit. Mm -hmm. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. Heirs of the kingdom ministries. Yes, sir. Heirs 
and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Amen? Amen? How many know that when you're born again, you not only become brothers and sisters of Christ, you become a brother and sister of Jesus. Heirs. That's your church. I, I don't know if I can preach that one. That's your, your ministry. <laughs> heirs and joint heirs. Yes. We have an inheritance uh -huh. that is now rightfully given to us that is coming. The family that we have, when I say this is my family yes. and these are my friends, when God begins to continue to lead you to another brother or sister in Christ, when your spirit leaps without even knowing them, you got to go with it. Yes. Say, God, I don't know why you brought us together. I never met him or her in my life. But it's something about their spirit that is recognizing my spirit. And kindred, the word kindred <coughs> means that the root word is kin, which means family. But it also means similar, connected. They have the same goal. So if you're a child of God, which I believe we are, most of us, I hope. Amen? If you're a child of God, what do we have similar? Jesus. There's but one head. And he's our Lord. He's our Savior. There's but one spirit. We all agree. And that spirit is in me. There's but one Father. The Father in heaven. And he's the one that we now have access to get to because of Jesus. There's no way to the Father, Daddy, except through the Son. So this family, anybody can join. This family is open to the world. Whosoever will, the Bible says, let them come. Do not forbid the little children as long as they understand. Amen? So this day, can you just stretch your hands out again? Then turn to your right, to your left, and say, just this is my family, and these are my friends. Amen? Do y'all receive it?